Okay. So every class from now on, if you don't hear that voice saying recording in progress, just put up your hand and remind me because I will tend to forget. This is one thing I tend to forget. So let me back up again. Okay. So, you know, I said, I don't want to teach the security analysis class. What do you like to teach? And said, I said, valuation. And he said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in the class to last 15 weeks. But I really, really wanted to teach this class. And I learned very early in my academic life that if you want to get anything done at a university, the best way to do it is to do it subversively. So as, rather than ask for permission, because you know, I could have put in for permission to teach this class, you know what would have happened? A committee would have been formed. You guys have experiences with committees being formed? You know what they tend to do? They meet and they meet and they meet. They forget what they're meeting about after a while, but they keep meeting. And then there are baby committees that they call subcommittees and sub subcommittees. And by the time they get back to you, it'll be 40 years later and you're too old to do it. So I said, I'll teach your damn security analysis class. I didn't use the word damn, but that was the attitude I had. I'd teach a security analysis class. And I walked in, closed the door, and taught evaluation class. They have no idea what I do in a classroom, especially in those days. There were no cameras. I could talk, I could teach cooking for 15 weeks, and nobody would know, as long as everybody got A's. You know how long it took them to catch on? In 2008, I get a call from the Dean's office. He said, we're here, you're teaching evaluation class. I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. They said, we don't see it anywhere in the schedule. I said, that's easy to explain. I've been hijacking all these other classes you've been giving me and teaching evaluation class instead. Remember you asked me to teach equity instruments and markets 15 years ago? I'm not in the least bit interested in instruments, markets, or even equity, which doesn't leave me with much. So I taught valuation instead. They said, that's not right. We should call it valuation. I said, I agree. So if you look at the NYU course schedule, you will see valuation taught for the first time in 2008. But last spring, when I taught this class, it was my 58th semester teaching the class. This will be my 60th semester teaching the class because I taught two, of, two sections last semester. And I'm going to say something about this class that's going to encapsulate how I think about valuation. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Notice how I framed that. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. I didn't know it the first time I walked in. In fact, a year into teaching this class in 1987, I still remember the day, it was October 19th of 1987. I come back from teaching my valuation class and this was when NYU was downtown. We were right next to the American Stock Exchange. And I looked out of the window and I saw all the traders were off the floor of the exchange on the street. I thought a fire alarm had gone off. But you know what happened on October 19th of 1987 that drove the traders onto the street? You had what was called a flash crash. The S&P 500 dropped 22%, 22% in one day. Trades could not be completed on the floor. The traders were on the street. You're saying, so what? Two days later at a class, and guess what the first question I was asked? How with valuation can you explain a 22% drop in the market in one day? And I couldn't blow it up. I had to talk about what in the process of pricing and valuation would explain a 22% drop. I learned how to deal with big market movements on October 19th of 1987 and talk about in class. Then you get to the next decade. What do you see? The dot-com boom. Companies with no history, no revenues, but a bunch of visitors to the website trading for billions of dollars. And again, I had no way of evading it. Somebody asked, how would you value a company with no history? I learned everything I know about valuing young growth companies in the process of valuing Amazon in the 1990s. 
Then you get to the next decade. And you get the banking crisis in 2008. And the question was, how, when a bank fails, is the value of every other company affected? That's societal, that's side costs. And I had to talk about how would you value a company in the midst of a banking crisis? Then you get to the most recent decade, you had the rise of social media companies, users, platforms. And the question was asked, how would you value a company that has not much in revenues, but millions of users? And I had to think about how do you value a user or user-based company? And already I can see the question being framed based on last week's events, right? How would you value a company where a crowd can get together and decide that the company is worth 10 times what it is today? And I'm not going to evade it. What I'm trying to say is everything in this class I've learned because I've had to talk about things that happen in real time. And I'm not going to stop this. During the course of the next five months, there will be things that happen that we did not expect. And I will have to talk about, you will have to talk about, we will have to talk collectively about how that plays out in valuation. Just be glad it's not the spring of 2020. Not only were we driven off campus mid-semester, but between February 14th and March 20th, we went through a full-fledged meltdown in the market while the class was going on. And guess what? We managed to live through it, learn from it, and move on. So what I'd like to talk about today is actually lay the foundations of a class, starting with the logistics. Sorry. Some reason my cursor is not exactly listening to me. Let's start with the logistics. It'll come back to the previous page. No. Okay. Obviously, office hours I will be in cyberspace. Why? Unless you any of you live in La Jolla, California? No? Then you can't, you won't find me because I'm not in New York, you're not in La Jolla. So you're going to find me, you're going to have to find me in cyberspace. Best way to get to me is email, don't, don't call me. But there's a phone number listed there, you know, which I've actually taken out because I never answer the phone anyway. My voicemail at, at my office is filled up. Yeah. My homepage, which is where the bulk of the stuff you're going to is, is listed there. And you know that already from the corporate finance class. As for office hours, now I'm going to try to reserve the hour on Monday and Wednesday before my classes all kick into high gear because I have three classes back to back to back. It'll be 11 to 12 New York time on Mondays and Wednesdays, but the fair game principle still applies. If you find me, it doesn't have to be in that, that hour. Now, the, the TAs for the class, you should be familiar with. They've been around, you know, if you're, especially if you're a second year MBA. Lorenzo and Javier took this class last spring as first year MBAs. And they're both intimately familiar with what the class involves. And, uh, and I'll make sure their office hours are listed. And every week they will have at least one hour where they go through problems and try to do the mechanics of this class. So here's what I'd like to spend today talking about. I want to talk about the broad themes for the class. And for many of you who are impatient to get to cash flows, growth rates, betas, risk premiums, I'm going to tell you that this class is more important than any of those classes because if you get the broad themes of valuation, everything else flows out of them. Here's the first one. No. I'm often asked, is valuation an art or a science? Don't look at the rest of my answer because that's cheating. I want to throw this out to you. Let's start with each part separately. Is valuation a science? Anybody, if you want to put up your hands, I'll call on you. Anybody? Is valuation a science? Let me, let me reframe the question. Is mathematics a science? Yes. It is the only pure science. In fact, mathematicians are convinced that the rest of us are imposters. Let me follow up on that. Who said yes to that? Um, you know? I did. Yes, you okay, so stay on, uh, keep your mic unmuted. What is it about mathematics that makes it a science? Yossi? Um, 
can be proven by empirical evidence, I would say. It goes beyond proven, right? It's absolutes. What's two plus three? Humor me. It's five. Whether I call my left hand, my right hand, a calculator, computer, North Pole, South Pole, there's no maybe five. It could be five. It might be five. It is five. The essence of a science is you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Mathematics is definitely a science. Physics is mostly a science, right? I noticed that many of you are on upper floors. Don't do this, I'm not encouraging you to do this, but if you got the window open and jumped out, you know exactly what's gonna to happen to you. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, what your IQ is, where you, you, know, you might have a job lined up at Goldman Sachs and McKinsey, it doesn't matter. The laws of gravity are the laws of gravity. They apply to all of us. Physics is mostly a science. But at the essence of a science is if you get the inputs right, you're gonna get the output right. Can valuation ever be a science? That's a question I'm asking. Let's say you sit down to value a company. It might be the company where you know more about the company than anybody else in the world. Let's suppose you are a GameStop fanatic. You know everything there is to know about the company. You know everything there is to know about valuation and you sit down to value the company. Obviously, you're going to bring in a great deal of information and thought into those inputs, right? But is your output going to be right? There is zero chance of it being right. You know why? Because you're not God. In case you are operating under the delusion that you are, you are not God. You don't control the future. There are things that are out of your control. Valuation can never be a science. And the sooner we recognize this, the healthier the discussion will become. You know, those accountants writing rules for valuation, they operate under the presumption that if they write enough rules, you know what, what I'm talking about, right? fair value accounting is writing all these rules. If we write these rules, in fact, uh, India actually a couple of years ago decided to have every appraiser go through the certification processing. And I asked the person at the top of this, why are you doing this? I said, this way our valuations will be right. right? I don't want to laugh right there because it would have been impolite, but it's not going to happen. Valuation is not a science, which must mean it's an art, right? Let's step back and ask the question. And let's again, keep the question at a simpler level. Is painting an art? I'm not talking about painting your house. I'm talking about, you know, the paintings I'm talking about, right? the ones that hang up in the, in the Met or the Louvre. Yeah, right. So what makes this Picasso guy so special? I still remember taking my oldest son, he's now 30, so when he was eight years old, to the Met for a Picasso exhibit. You know how long an eight-year-old lasts in a museum? You, you need substantial amounts of bribery to even get them in there. Even more bribery to keep them in there. He lasted about 25 minutes because of the Picasso exhibit pa passing through. We come out and I said, no, Ryan, what do you think of that? He said, dad, I was not impressed. I said, what do you mean you're not impressed? That was Picasso. He said, this guy can't get the nose in the right place. We noticed about Picasso's, the nose comes out of the side of the head. The top. It's almost like he was either drugged or drunk, which given his history, he was probably both. But for whatever reason, we've gathered together that Picasso guy is special, it's worth a hundred million. I know there are people who will disagree with this, but the essence of art is, well, you can teach parts of art. A great artist, I mean, you can't teach it. You're, you're either a great artist or you're not. It's something you're born with that makes you special. Thank God. Valuation is not an art or a wasted 35 years of my life trying to teach something that cannot be taught. If it's not a science and it's not a, an art, what the heck is it? I'll give you the word that I use to describe valuation. It's a craft. You know what the analogy that comes closest to valuation is? It's cooking. How do you master cooking? You could watch the Food Network, 16 hours a day. And some of you do, right? You watch chopped episode after chopped episode, beat Bobby Flay, beat Bobby Flay. No. You could read every cookbook on the face of the earth. But you can't cook a leg. 
to learn cooking, what do you have to do? You have to go into that room, that place you've been avoiding in your apartment for a long time called the kitchen. Remember it exists? The takeout, you think, what kitchen? You know, that's the room I shut off, I converted it into a media studio. And you have to cook, and the first time you cook, what happens? Fire alarms go off. You have to order out that day, but you will learn something. But I remember the first time I scrambled eggs. Nobody told me I was supposed to spray the damn pan. So I scrambled the eggs. They look really good, but they don't come off the pan. Pan and eggs go into the trash, but I learned a very important lesson about cooking eggs. You learn cooking by cooking. You learn valuation, not by watching other people talk about valuation, which means these sessions by themselves are not gonna help you learn valuation. Not by reading what others think about valuation, but by doing. Do you know what I'm gonna do? Every week for the next 15 weeks, I'm gonna put up what I call a valuation of the week. So I haven't made up my mind what to put up tomorrow. Maybe I'll put up GameStop and I'll put up my valuation of GameStop that I sent the link to. And I'm gonna ask you to value GameStop. And what's your first reaction gonna be? It's the first week of class. I really don't know how to do it. And I'm gonna say, try, give it your best shot. And once you're done, I'm gonna create a Google shared spreadsheet where you can go in and enter what you came up with as the value of GameStop with your assumptions. Change what you're comfortable changing. Next week, I'm going to pick a different company, as different from GameStop as I can get. Like what? Maybe we'll do Airbnb next week. The week after that, maybe I'll pick PZ Cousins Nigeria. You say, I've never heard of the company. Hey, you know what? Every company values a US company. You might never learn what the troubles are, the issues are in valuing a company in Nigeria and Naira. And every week, I want you to at least take 15 or 20 minutes and change what you feel comfortable changing. And I'll make a prediction based on history. In the first week, you're going to look at my valuation. And you're going to say, well, you know what? I, the guy must know what he's doing. You really don't know that I don't know what I'm doing. But right now, you think I know what I'm doing. You say, well, I'm not going to change his revenue. He must have some secret crystal ball for revenues and margins. I'll just add a third decimal on the risk-free rate and leave everything else as is. You know what you're gonna get as value, right? Pretty much my value. And you're gonna to come to me and say, well, you know what? I agree with your valuation. You're gonna think that this is a good thing. And I'm gonna put up a histogram and you're gonna find we all agree on my value being the right value in week one. You know how I know this class is working? is when we get to week six, you're going to look at my valuation. That was terrible. I would never use that growth rate. And you're going to come and tell me, hey, everything you did in that valuation was wrong. And my reaction is the class is working. You have to get your hands dirty, valuing companies to actually learn valuation. And the more diverse the companies you value, the more you will learn. Second, I mean, I know many of you can't come into this class to learn how to value public companies, high profile companies, the Teslas, the, the Airbnbs, the GameStops, the world. We be pretty, that's all we did. This is a class about valuing or pricing, just about anything. So are we gonna value public companies? Yes, we're also gonna value private companies. Are we going to value large public companies? Yes, but we're also going to value small public companies. Are we going to value US companies? Yes, but we're also going to value emerging market companies. This is a class about valuing companies across the life cycle, across sectors. So no matter what kind of business you're in, you should be able to value the company. But I'm also going to argue that sometimes what you think you're doing and call valuation is really pricing. You know, what's the difference? You know what the pricing for a company is? It's what other people are willing to pay for it. And I'll give you an analogy. I don't know how many of you own the apartment you live in. Anybody own your apartment? Well, we extract so much intuition from you. How the heck can you afford to own anything other than that, right? 
But if you own your own apartment or your house, think about how you acquire that apartment. Usually I hired a realtor, right? The realtor showed you the apartment and named the price or the house and named the price. I don't mean to be mysterious, but how did the realtor come up with that 800,000, 1 million, 1.5 million, whatever the number was that they said, how did, they, did they do an intrinsic valuation of your house? Maybe they did a DCF? I don't think so. How did they come up with the number for your house? They looked at other houses in the neighborhood, looked at what they sold for, and they said, that's what people are willing to pay for a three bedroom with a backyard in this neighborhood. That's what you have to pay. Now, you can not like that. You say, that's too much. Hey, guess what? You lived in San Francisco last year or two years ago, and you were shown an apartment that was this hole in the wall, and you were told hey, you have to pay a million dollars. You said, that's not fair. Well, guess what? That's what other people were paying. You were stuck with that's pricing. I'm going to argue there are some investments that can only be priced. And if you read my blog post, you saw my, my argument for to, va to value something, what do you need? You need cash flows. You can value a stock, you can value a bond, you can value a business, you can value a rental property because they all have cash flows. You can't value a Picasso. There are no cash flows. You can price a Picasso based on what? Based on what other people think about noses being in the wrong place. You cannot price a currency. I'm sorry, you cannot value a currency. You can price a currency against other currencies. That's an exchange rate. You cannot price currencies. You cannot price collectibles. That beanie baby you've been saving for the last 20 years thinking it's coming back while well, you're barking up the wrong tree. You said, what's the pricing I will get for that beanie, beanie baby? Well, guess what? I've got to go find what other people are paying for beanie babies to decide what you should pay for yours. We're going to spend this class talking about, I'm going to draw the contrast between value and price and argue that many people who claim to be valuing things are really pricing them. There's not much in this class that I would call new and different. Perhaps the one part of the class that I would not have taught if I'd been teaching this class 50 years ago. I couldn't have because I'd have been too young to teach the class, but assuming you know, I'd be able to go back in time and teach the class. The one part of the class that is different is applying what are called option pricing models, not to value options, that's for a different class, but we're valuing assets with contingent cash flows. What am I talking about? Let's suppose you know of a young pharmaceutical company right now that's working on a COVID vaccine. There's no other products. And this vaccine is a single shot and it's 100% effective and it's working its way through the pipeline. It's not been approved yet. You see how you're buying an option? Your cash flows are contingent on what happening, that that drug gets approved. You could be worth billions, but if it doesn't get approved because there's a side effect you haven't heard about yet, the company could be worth nothing. That's an option you're buying. You invest in a company like Petrobras. Heard of Petrobras? It's a Brazilian oil company with a long and fairly turbulent history, to put it mildly. It's a company that found a lot of oil reserves in and around Brazil. But many of these reserves are under rocks, under oceans. They would cost 40, 50, maybe even $60 to extract. If oil prices go to 35, what's your first reaction? Those reserves are worth nothing, right? But you know why that would be a mistake? They're worth nothing at today's oil price. But what's the contingency? If oil prices go to $85 a barrel, hey, you know what? If Saudi Arabia has something significant happen that causes oil production from the Middle East to drop off, oil prices go to 85, right? There's an option here. Undeveloped natural resources have an optionality. And there's all this talk about platforms and the value of platforms. You know what I'm talking about? The company which has 100 million users on its platform. It might not be making much in revenue. It might be losing tons of money, but people keep talking about the value of a platform. Platforms don't pay dividends. What's the value of a platform? That somehow you can find a way to take those 100 million users and do other things with them. Sell them stuff. You haven't thought of it yet, but you're saying there is a value. That's an option value. 
So if you invest in Twitter, you're clearly not investing in Twitter because it's a well-managed company. It's not. It's a horrifically badly managed company. But the fact is it has 300 million users. And even though they haven't figured out what to do in terms of monetizing these users and making money yet, maybe, maybe, maybe one of these days, Dorsey will move to South Africa, wherever he wants to move to. Somebody else will run the company and find a way to do it. And you could get value. There's an option there. My point is, this is a class where at the end of the class, no matter what I give you, you should be able to put a number on it. Third, I want to draw this contrast between value and price. It's something you're going to see me kind of, I might seem almost obsessive about this. Tell you how obsessive this morning I got, a, I got an email from, from a journalist at, uh, at Bloomberg and she said, now, uh, how it, she was talking about the fact that um, Elon Musk was on Clubhouse. I didn't even know what Clubhouse was until two weeks ago. I was invited to be on Clubhouse. I said, what club? Where's this house? And it turns out to be a social media platform where you talk to young people. And um, he had, of course, mentioned the stocks he mentioned have all shot up. So her point is, what do you do in a world where the valuation of companies can be affected by an Elon Musk interview on Clubhouse? I didn't even read the rest of the question. I said, I think you need to reframe this question. The question is not what's happening to value. Elon Musk is not making us go to GameStop and buy games, but he could push up the price of GameStop. I said, instead of using the word value, you should be using price. And it's something you're going to see me do repeatedly in this class is draw that contrast. And here's what the contrast is. What drives the value of an asset we've known for a long time? It's driven by cash flows, growth, and risk. There's no mystery about it. It's always been the case. So that Venetian glassmaker in the 1400s or 1500s who sold his business, you know, the value is based on cash flows, growth, and risk. Now, of course, we've invented in the last 100 years data and tools to make those cash flows, growth, and risk more explicit. A discounted cash flow model is a manifestation of that concept. And let's bring cash flows, growth, and risk into one equation. But valuation precedes that. Value is driven by cash flows, growth, and risk. You know what price is driven by? After last week, the answer is easy, demand and supply. What drives demand and supply? God only knows. It could be cash flows, growth, and risk, but let's face it, nothing fundamental happened last week at GameStop. It's not like suddenly they said, hey, you know what? Everybody's coming into these GameStop stores in abandoned malls and just buying stuff. It could be mood, it could be momentum. It could even be revenge. You know what I mean by revenge, right? A lot of the people on Wall Street bets who are going after GameStop, if you ask them, what's your end game? It's not even that they want to make money. They want to drive hedge funds out of business or those particular hedge funds. Is that irrational? No, it's human nature. The pricing process will reflect everything that's happening out there. It's driven by mood and momentum. So the value process is cash flows, growth and risk. The pricing process is driven by demand and supply. So you shouldn't the two be roughly the same? What do you have to believe about markets for the two to be roughly the same for all companies? That you believe markets are? What's the magic word? Efficient. Efficient. So if you asked a gene farmer, you know, who got a Nobel Prize for his work in efficient markets, he would say, what can? Value and price can be different, but the difference is random. You can never find them. They should be roughly the same. I don't believe markets are efficient. Otherwise I wouldn't be teaching this class because you know how long this class would last in an efficient market? What's the best value for GameStop in an efficient market? Open the paper, look at the price, right? The very fact that I'm sitting talking about valuation tells you a little bit about what I think about market efficiency. I think there's a gap. But you know what? I'll also tell you that finding that gap is really difficult and making money off that gap is even more difficult. But when you talk about value and price, you're talking about two different processes. Value, you're like trying to figure out what business is, or you know, come up with cash flows, growth, and risk. Pricing, you're looking at other people are paying for similar investments and you're trying to put a number on a company. 
Now let me introduce a concept that I think is central to this class. So I'm going to, now let's see if I can pull up that poll because I think this is a good polling question. Ready? I'm gonna launch the poll and I want, there's no right answer. So don't look at your neighbor, don't look at me. I want you to pick what best fits you. So basically, are you a number crunch, natural number cruncher, you're a natural storyteller, you're comfortable with both, I cannot, or you're one of those people who can't handle neither, in which case I'm really worried about what you're doing here in the first place. You know, see a lot of people as, basically having their cake and eating it is on both, that's, that's good. Yeah. I'm gonna push you on that answer anyway, but no, let's keep going. Okay, so we're close to full response. I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna show you what the results look like. Okay, so it looks like almost exactly the same number, 26% number crunches, 26% uh, uh, storytellers. Does that surprise you? When you sat in evaluation class, you thought you're gonna be sitting in with a lot of bankers. First thing is, this means you can get more comfortable, which means if you're a storyteller, you have lots of company in the class. Don't look over your shoulder, oh my God, maybe I'm the only storyteller, you're not alone. Quite a few of you pick both. I'm gonna push you on that concept because let's face it, even if you pick both, there's still a side that you trust more. I may, no, I'll go first because you know, I don't want to give, you made your choices. I'll tell you when I knew what I was. It was, uh, I was about 12 years old. I think it was my first English literature class and I was asked to read Moby Dick. And I did, I was a good kid. I came ready for a discussion of whales and captains. And about 20 minutes into the class, I noticed that nobody was talking about the whale or the captain. So I put up my hand and said, when are we gonna talk about the whale? And the instructor said, there is no whale. He said, did I read the wrong book? I distinctly remember a big fish all the way through this book. And she said, it's a metaphor. My jaw dropped. And the rest of the class was about hidden meanings in the things. It's like reading the life of Pi. I mean, who gets on a raft with a tiger and lives to tell the tale? But I remember reading the book. At the end of the book, there was this whole discussion section of there's no tiger, no cook. There's a whole, and I said, really? And I remember coming out of that class with a singular conclusion. I said, never again am I going to subject myself to that kind of bullshit. And the rest of my school life was laid out for me, right? I avoided the literature classes like the plague. It was algebra one, algebra two, algebra three, and out of high school. And these were the good old days. You know what was true in the good old days? You could go to college and you had no core curriculum. You guys are all too young. So basically you've all gone, you know what I mean by the core curriculum? You go to college as an undergraduate. What did they make you do for the first two years? take classes you don't want to take. You got to take a history class. Why? To round out your education. It's a complete lie. You know why you need to take the history class? Because if you didn't take it, the history department would have to be fired. So to keep them employed, they have to make you take the history class. Those days, you could get through school and you could take, go to college. You could take numbers class, numbers class, numbers degree. Like what? Accounting, engineering, science, then a numbers job, banker, accountant, actuary. You're in numbers heaven. You hang out with other numbers people, you talk about numbers, you all speak the same language. You're a numbers person. As opposed to what? As opposed to that person in my class who loved hidden meanings, they're the poets. My youngest son writes poetry showed me his first poem. I don't think he's gonna show me anymore. He said, well, dad, what do you think? I said, no, are the last words supposed to rhyme? Because that's my vision of poetry, stuck in you know, nursery rhymes. And he said, dad, you're not a poet. And he's never shown me any more poetry. And he's right, I'm not a poet. 
they take literature one, literature two, literature three, they graduate from high school, they go to college, they become history majors from Yale, they graduate, they go into, the first they find that even history majors from Yale don't get paid very much, you know, become a journalist, uh, you know, one of those, you know, and then about five years in, both groups realize they're in trouble. The numbers people discover they're incredibly bored of entering numbers and spreadsheets and doing nothing. So they quit and where are they? they? They're back in school. So that's why you're here. And the story people realize they're not paying very much and they're tired of living as po in po with poverty stricken wages. And they say, you know what? I'm gonna go back to school. So you're both here. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Which of you thinks that you have the upper hand in this class. Do you think it's better to be a numbers person or a story person if you're doing valuation? Now, when I talk to people, you know what their reaction is? Valuation is all about numbers and Excel spreadsheets and you know, this is all about numbers. Someone let you in on a secret. And this is good news for those of you who claim that you have two sides and they're both equally balanced, so you, you work on both. A good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. Do you know what I mean by a bridge between stories and numbers? When you show me the valuation of a company and I see revenues in year 10, let's say it's Airbnb, and you tell me that the revenues in year 10 would be $50 billion. And I ask you, how did you get to 50 billion in year 10? You know the answer I don't want to hear is? It's because I used a 40% growth rate for the first five years, 30% in your, that's not the answer. That doesn't tell me anything. I want your story for Airbnb. Is it a booking company? Is it a travel company that'll allow them to have 50 billion in revenues? Every number in your valuation has to have a story attached to it. And every story you tell me about the company, about its great management, its amazing employees has to show up as a number. I would love to tell you that I've known this right from the beginning, but I did not. In fact, when I first started teaching valuation, I taught it like a number cruncher, did, which is when in doubt, put up an equation. If you're still doubtful, put up a second equation. If it's still shaky, make them simultaneous equations. So it will prove nothing, but it makes you feel more comfortable. But six years into teaching this class, I realized I had a problem. It's a long time to come to that realization. I realized that I could value just about anything, but I had no faith. Strange word to use, right? In fact, in the next slide, the next theme is going to be about faith. Faith in what? Why do we do value companies? Is it because we're intellectually curious? I'm not. I don't lie awake and say, I wonder what Facebook is worth right now. Maybe you do, in which case, I would suggest counseling. That doesn't sound healthy. You know why we value companies, right? For one reason and one reason alone, we want to be able to act on those valuations. Which is a good time to introduce my fifth theme because that'll allow me to talk about why I realized I had no faith. Oops. You have to be able to, so let me ask you a question. What is it you need to have to be able to go from evaluation to action? Manav, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You valued a company. What's your, do you have any, any favorite companies in mind? Company you always wanted in your portfolio? Maybe AirDoc, the TerryDoc. Okay, so you value the company, you come up with $50 per share. The stock is trading at 30. Would you, to buy the shares in the company, you need faith in two things. What are the two things you need faith in? First, you need faith in your value for the company, right? You've made these assumptions, you come up with a valuation, you might know all the mechanics, but you need faith in your valuation. It's the second thing you need faith in. To make money, what has to happen? The price has to go to value. I'll let you in on a dirty little secret. We like to beat up market efficiency. Makes us feel better, right? Well, our markets are not efficient, I think. We, you know what, we all believe in market efficiency. The question is when? Manav buys the shares and then what does he hope and pray for? 
efficient markets or price goes to value. You know why a week like last week shakes you to the core? Because it raises a question, maybe markets are completely random, in which case all the homework you've done becomes completely useless. You need faith in your value and faith that the price will adjust to value. You know why I've used the word faith, right? I know how many of you are, rel uh, are religious, but if you go to church or temple or wherever you go, let's say you go and you go up to the priest, the rabbi, you know, and you say, look, you know, I've been coming to church and, you know, I, you know, I believe in God, but can you offer me some, I'm, I'm getting a little shaky here. Can you offer me some proof that God exists? What's the priest going to say? No, I mean, if, if, the, if the priest is not a, you know, is, is not a fake priest, he's going to say, or she's going to say, well, you have to have faith. The essence of faith is you're doing this even though I cannot offer you proof. I'm trying to preempt a question you might have later in this class, which is, hey, if I do everything you ask me to do and I do these discounted cash flow evaluations, will I make money? My answer is, I don't know, but you need to have faith. You think, what if I don't have that faith? Because remember, I can tell you, and during the course of this class, I will talk both about my faith in those two, where, where it comes from, but I'll also be pretty open about when my sh faith gets shaken, because I'd be lying if I told you, I always have faith. Of course, my faith gets shaken, like it was last week. And I'm okay with that. In fact, if anybody says, I have absolute faith, that's not faith, that's dogma. One reason I've never gone to Omaha for that value investing Woodstock. You know what I'm talking about where you go to Omaha and you pray at the shrine of two valuation gods and everything they say is absolute. That's not investing, that's religion. And investing is about faith, which means you have to be open to the possibility that you're wrong, that you might be barking up the wrong tree. Maybe this doesn't work at all. Which means you could effectively at the end of this class decide after your encounters that this isn't working for you. In which case, you know what you should do? Buy index funds and go back to living the rest of your life. You don't have to do valuation to be a worthy investor. So one of the things we're gonna talk about is faith and how that faith gets shaken and what, I mean, Let's face it, if you're an investor, your faith, it's almost like you, you do something and the market comes and knocks on your door the next day, do you still have faith? Do you still have faith? And you're gonna see how difficult it is to actually have faith in markets because things can change. So let me set up the, uh, the outlines for what this class, you know, what, what we're going to do, you know, what this class will be and how it will be structured. I'm going to do a kind of an intro class. Next session, we're going to put the, set up the table and look at these are the three different ways you can invest. And I'm going to talk about what I call the Bermuda Triangle evaluation. Where is the Bermuda Triangle? This mythical place in the Atlantic, I think, where ships and planes disappear and they don't come back. The Bermuda Triangle evaluation is where good sense goes in and doesn't come out. We'll talk about what it is that causes valuations to go off the rails. Then we're gonna spend about maybe eight or nine sessions talking about details, cash flows, growth risk. And for those of you in my corporate finance class, a big chunk of this will be review, or if you're in any corporate finance class. But I think it's good to review things like where do we know, how do we measure risk? How do we come up with risk premiums? What is a cash flow? And as we're doing this, you're going to get incredibly impatient because we're not going to be valuing companies. We're going to be doing pieces of companies. So when are we going to get to value? When are we going to value a company? And in between sessions 12 and 15, we will take those details and we'll go to town. We'll value company after company, different companies. And you're going to see that once you get the details down, the mechanics of value companies kind of falls. Once we get to session 15, we've got the intrinsic value part of this class done. In section 16 through 19, we're gonna talk about pricing. P ratios, EV debit. Anytime you use a multiple, do not use the word valuation to what comes out of a multiple. 
you're doing pricing, nothing wrong with it. We're going to talk about doing pricing right, how to do it right. And we're going to spend one session on private company valuation, only one session, because if you've got the basics nailed down, valuing a private company is not a big deal. There are mechanical issues around it. We'll talk about those. And then we'll bring in the options part of the class. I know how comfortable you are with option pricing models, but you'll have to do it. So I'll do a session just on getting the mechanics of option pricing models down. And we'll talk about what's called real options, valuing distressed equity as an option, valuing a platform as an option, valuing undeveloped resources as an option. And once we get through that, we essentially will have the whole class done. The last couple of applied sessions will be on things you can take valuation tools and try them on, acquisition valuation. I was once asked to teach an M&A class and I said, my class would last two sessions and then I'm done. Because to me, there's nothing special about valuation, about valuation in m &A. It's all about deal mechanics and I have zero interest in those, but I'm going to talk about the valuation aspects of m and value and control, value synergy. And in the last real session, I'm going to talk about value enhancement. How do you change the value of a company? You become GM, GameStop CEO. What can you do to change the value? Forget about price. What could you do operationally to make yourself a more valuable company? So we're going to look at valuation from every conceivable angle, different kinds of ways of thinking about valuation. In terms of... Uh, Pre-season prep, it's too late because the season's already started. But you know, if your accounting is weak, I, over the summer, created an accounting class from my perspective. And like a pure accountant will blanch if you show him or her this class because you know, it's, a, it's not an accounting. It's about the, the accounting I think we need in valuation, which is a subset of accounting. If your statistics is shaky, there's a primer. I'm planning to create a class sometime in the next month or two. So if you're, you know, if you don't know what a regression coefficient is and R squared, that kind of lead through basics of statistics. And finally, if your foundations are weak, which it shouldn't be, you know, present value, you know, difference between different kinds of securities, there's a class I've created, uh, uh, my version of a foundations class. This class structure should look familiar for those of you who have. Um, well, who have actually taken um, my corporate finance class, which means that starting today, the torture starts. You're gonna get an email from me pretty much every day until May 10th. I might give you a break during spring break, which is like three days this semester rather than a week. And the class is gonna Mondays, you'll have the class, you'll have an email after the class Tuesdays, I'm gonna put up the valuation of the week, which means tomorrow the first valuation of the week will go up. Wednesdays, another class, an email about the class. Thursdays, I will remind you, nag you about the project. And the project is basically got to pick a company, any company you want. And over the course of the semester, you can value the company. And the valuation will come at the cherry on the top, which is after you've done your valuation and pricing of the company, I'm going to ask you, are you buying? Are you selling? And no weaseling out. No weak buys, no weak sells, preferably no holds because you can't hold something you don't own. I'm gonna push you to make a decision. And I'll make a deal with you. At the end of the class, I will show you what you collectively found as a class. What percentage came out undervalued, what percentage came out as overvalued. What were the 10 most undervalued, what were the 10 most overvalued. And among the 10 most undervalued, I'm gonna send each of you an email saying, you found your company to be over undervalued. You said you were buying, are you actually buying? And if you are, I will jump on that particular stock with you. Every semester that I've taught this class, I pick one company from the top 10 list and it's usually the condition is, hey, how much, do you have enough faith to actually, because if you don't, I'm not jumping on. You know what the most undervalued stock last spring was? This class? GameStop. I came so close. I actually emailed the guy and, and because he had a good story about the company. And I said, you know what? This looks like a decent valuation. Are you buying? And the person weaseled out saying, I don't have enough money now. You know, I don't. I, so I said, and the stock was trading at $6 per share. 
So I'm hoping that you will turn in your own version of GameStop and have faith in it because you know. And um, every, fr every Friday I will send you a webcast on something very pragmatic and practical, which would be things like how do you estimate an equity risk premium for a company, which is a multinational. So I'll take you through the process of where you get the data, how you put it together. So kind of as a guide to keep your project moving. Saturday, you get a weekly newsletter. If you remember this from corporate finance, it's very little newsletter. It's just basically a GPS for where we are in the class and where we're going. And Sunday, I'll send you a preview of what's coming the next week. It kind of covers every day of the week. Now, because this class will be entirely online, we'll have, I mean, there are a couple of things where you can help me. One is, um, you know, the broadband is always an issue. Some of you will have broadband failures while you're listening, which is not catastrophic for me. But I could have issues with my broadband, which could be catastrophic, which means the class is not going to get delivered. Sometimes I don't even know that I'm lagging or there's a problem. If there's a problem, the only way I know is for you to let me know because then I can turn off at least my video, keep my audio going. And I also understand that many of you are in time zones where this class is going to be difficult. I'm, I'm not that many because that's why I asked you to fill in that you no, know, there are like six or seven people who are either in parts of Asia where you're 13 hours you know, away from New York, which means that this class will be right in the middle of the night. And I think there's one person in Australia who had this. So if that's the case, I'm not expecting to wake up in the middle of the night and watch the class. That's kind of inhumane. So class will be recorded and uh, it'll be the Zoom recording. There'll be, a, there'll be a downloadable version of the file and also make sure that the audio version is downloadable. And I'll create a YouTube version of the class as well. The advantage of YouTube is even though it's the same session, it adapts to whatever your broadband is. You can watch it on a phone, you can watch it on an iPad, no bad connections, not a big deal. So if you cannot make it to the classes, I understand, but I will give you ways of keeping up with the class. Class material, I'll put links to the class. So the lecture notes, uh, there'll be a post-class test for every class where you can test out, it'll take you about five to 10 minutes, see how you're comfortable you are with the material. And, um, and we'll get through this. I mean, I'd rather teach this class physically, but given that we're online, we'll make the best of it. In terms of books, I have um, a bunch of valuation books, none of which are required. Okay. So if you don't want to buy any of these books, I'm perfectly okay. I make so little for my publishers anyway, I really couldn't care less. You know I mean? But uh, I, I'll give you a comparison. You can pick either a textbook type, which is the investment valuation book. And incidentally, if you decide to go the investment valuation book, here's a dirty little secret. You go on Amazon, there's a trade version of the book and there's a textbook version of the book. The trade version, I think costs $45. The textbook costs $70. You know what the difference is between the two books? Absolutely nothing. It's the exact same book. You think that makes no sense. That's what I've been trying to tell publishers in the US for a long time, but they're, they make so much money on textbooks that they price them obscenely and expect you to pay. In this class, you don't have to invest in valuation. You can get the trade version. Every other book on that list is a trade book. So it shouldn't be as obscenely overpriced as the invest valuation book. And you can pick whichever one you want. And if you feel comfortable enough with mechanics, I would suggest the narrative and numbers book about connecting stories and numbers. I also have an app for the iPhone that I sent the link to called Uvalue that I co-developed with a friend of mine at Dartmouth, you know, and Sundaram. And it's a, it's, you know, it might just be biased to you, but it's a pretty, I mean, it's the reason I developed it is so much of what banks, analysts, and appraisers do is can't. They just take numbers and put it into a CAN model that I said, why are you guys paying tens of thousands of dollars for something you can get for nothing? Okay. So this is um, my ham-handed attempt to be a Wall Street bets kind of person. This is my version of disrupting the status quo. So you know, if you have an iPad or an iPhone, it has to be an Apple device, unfortunately. I don't do Android, I'm sorry. You, know, you can download the app and try it out, you know, see what you think about it. There'll be other ways I harass you. The website for the class, which is, you know, I've sent you a couple of links to this is where, that'll be the platform where you get pretty much everything for this class. And as, as I said, a YouTube playlist of every class, every session in the class that you can track. 
incidentally, I, I shouldn't be telling you this since you pay full tuition for this class, but while you're taking this class, I, I kept track of the numbers, there are about 123,000 people who'll be taking the class with you. Don't worry, there won't be on a Zoom session. I don't think you can do a Zoom meeting with 123,000 people, but they will have access to the recordings and the material. They will not get credit for the class. They will, you know, but the good news for them is they don't pay for the class. So, you know, so I'm, I am giving a, a class for free, you know, but no, it is what it is. Finally, there's a Google Calendar. I sent you the link for this, which shows you when the quizzes and the exams are because the quizzes will be online. And to accommodate the fact that you will be often on different time zones. Now I'll give you a, a day and there'll be a period during the day, which is long enough that no matter what time zone you're in, you can pick the time you want to take the, the, the quiz or the exam. Now, the one thing I have to do differently in this class than I would in a normal class is because these online classes, especially the big classes, don't lend themselves well to open-ended questions. I have, I don't like multiple choice. I'll tell you up front because it's, I think, punitive for people who know stuff and just make silly mistakes. But unfortunately, for this kind, this bigger class online, I have to convert my exams to multiple choice. But there won't be multiple choice, and this is the 50 multiple choice questions. They'll be the questions I would ask as open-ended questions with. So it'll be like five multiple choice questions over an hour, which means you'll have plenty of time to check your numbers, but the quizzes and the exams will. Now, I, you know, almost everything I do that's current will be on my blog, as you saw with my GameStop um, post that I sent you. So if you get a chance, you know, visit my blog, read, you know, because everything is related to this class. And, and, and if you want more readings, there's plenty of stuff here. Now the unpleasant stuff, now, I know this is uh, perhaps the last semester for many of you. you, can't wait to graduate and you wanna make sure you at least pass the class. Well, that's gonna be pretty easy to do. But you think in terms of grades, here's how I know, I, you'll have to leave, you'll have to have enough faith in me to do this. But essentially, if you can value just about everything, then you deserve an A. So I have to figure out how to test that. If you can value most things, then I'll, you know, you're B, B, B plus. If you can value some things, which is a pretty low bar, then you're a C. If you can value nothing at the end of this class, then I don't know why you would get a grade in the class. I, it's very difficult to value nothing unless you really don't try in this class. So I think that you know, my objective is to not fail you, but to get, not just get you through, but to be able to get as close to value just about everything as I can get. Now, in terms of the basis, um, th there will be a project. The project will be a group project. I know that's a bit of a bit tricky because you're all online, but find people that you're comfortable working with. The groups can be anywhere from four to seven, and um, you're going to be valuing a company and pricing the company. And unlike my corporate finance class, where I didn't even ask for anything till the very last day. This class, I am going to push you for something in the middle of the class to show me you're doing things. You know why? Because when you're a second year MBA, especially as you head towards May of your graduation, there's a tendency to prematurely graduate, which means in your mind in March, you're done. Which means if I ask you to do things in April and May, it gets really difficult. And I'm going to ask you to turn in your discounted cash flow valuation mid semester, not for a grade. In fact, it's going to be for feedback. So if you're whichever company you valued, I'll give you a window where you can turn in the DCF. I will take a look and it won't be a detailed feedback saying, I don't like your story. It'll be for just to check to see for internal consistency so that you're on the right track. The, the overall project, which will be due, will be due on the last day of class, which is May 10th. No. Now in terms of individual work, you know, of course, of the quizzes and the exams, there'll be three quizzes and spread out over the semester and one final exam. Now, the three quizzes will each be worth 10%. The final exam is 30%. And because again, this is online, you know, they will be on the days that are designated. And if you're not able to take a quiz for whatever reason, you don't lose the 10%, it'll get moved to the other exams that, uh, that fall. So let me repeat, if you miss the first quiz, I'll move that 10% to the second, third quiz in the final. If you miss the second quiz, I'll move that score to the third quiz in the final. If you miss the third quiz, I'll move the 10% to the final. But it'll always be forward. And the reason for that is very simple. Otherwise you get strategic 
quiz miss. You know what I mean by that? If you do really well then on the first two quizzes, you say, look, you know, I'm going to make those quizzes worth more by missing the third quiz. That's not going to work. It's always going to be in the future. So if you want to, if you have to miss a quiz, it's not catastrophic. The one advantage you get from taking all three quizzes is I will throw out your lowest score and replace it with the average score you had in your remaining exams, which means if you get a three, a nine, a nine, and a 27, you got a, roughly a 90% of your remaining quizzes, I'll replace the three with a nine. And you get that only if you take all the quizzes. As for the groups, you know, I'm going to let you guys figure out who's going to be in your group. I know you could, no, I'm not going to force you into a group, but if you look at that Google shared spreadsheet, I ask you, are you in a group? As you get into groups, please go in and enter, yes, I'm in a group. Because at some point, perhaps a week from now, I'm going to check that list and you're not in a group and you have real trouble. I'll create an orphan list and put you up for adoption, which means other groups that need an extra person can add you on. So that's a group work on, um, and, and, and that's pretty much all the logistical stuff. Any questions on the logistics? Little bit about the companies you can value. If you remember in corporate finance there are all kinds of constraints, you can't value money losing company, you can't value a company that is a financial, so no constraints. You can pick whatever company you want and there doesn't have to be anything in common across Let's say there are five people in your group and you pick five companies. They don't have to be in the same country. The same. You can pick whatever. Each person can pick the company they want to do. But I'm going to impose an overall group constraint. And this is where the group work comes in. At least one person in every group has to pick a money losing company, which after 2020 shouldn't be difficult to do, a money losing company. At least one person in the group has to pick a growth company. And I'm gonna let growth be defined very broadly as revenue growth or even user growth. So you wanna pick Airbnb or you can, you know. And at least one person in every, every group has to pick a service company. And service is pretty much everything other than manufacturing. So that's an easy constraint. And one company in each group has to be an emerging market company. You can't all do US companies. So it has to be a non-US company. It doesn't even have to be emerging market. Now, of course, you could pile all the constraints into one person, you know what I mean? Pick a money losing, high growth, emerging market company and put it all on one guy or one person. Because let's face it, things are more difficult when you face those constraints. But here's what, what I wanted to factor in. This is not about just valuing the company, it's about learning valuation. And you know what? You're gonna learn more valuation by valuing an Airbnb than you are valuing Coca-Cola. Anybody can value Coca-Cola, it's not a big deal. So your objective is learn about valuation, go where it's darkest, pick a nice Ukrainian mining company. There are no nice Ukrainian mining companies, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Go to a market or a sector where there is tremendous disruption going on and walk right into the middle and give it your best shot. Because I'm not going to judge you on whether your valuation is right. You know why? Because I don't know what the right valuation is. I'm going to judge you on how you approach valuing the company. How do you tell a story? How do you convert the story into numbers? So I am going to start at least, how many minutes do we have left in class? Like 11 minutes? Class goes through 320, right? Okay, let's get started on the package. I told you the Sorry. Okay. So what I'd like to do, and as I said, this session and the rest of the next session is just lay the table for the different ways of thinking about value. Now, I've often been asked why I do valuation. And I tell people it's to fight the lemming in me. You guys have heard of lemmings? 
Lemmings became famous and infamous in the 1950s when National Geographic filmed the most amazing sight. They filmed thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures gathering together on a cliff, running right off the cliff into, a, into an ocean, committing collective suicide. And ever since one of those big questions was, you know, why do they do it? What drives them off the cliff? I don't know the answer to the question, but let's do some virtual imagery. You could see why the first lemming did it, right? It's running too fast, he couldn't stop, off the cliff, into the ocean. Incidentally, these guys can't swim, see the deal, dead. Second lemming, too close to the first guy, into the ocean too. But put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming in that group. I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but kind of hang in there with the analogy anyway. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear off that cliff. I would assume you have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? Your left brain, your right brain, whatever part of you is rational, saying, stop, stop, don't do this. And then you hear this voice in the back of your head. You know what it's saying? They must know something that I don't. Remember those seven words, the seven most deadly words in investing evaluation. They must know something that I don't. I'll tell you when you hear it. I know somebody in this class is going to pick Tesla to value. Not just somebody, they're like seven people, 10 people pick Tesla. Let's say you value Tesla and you come up with $200 per share. You dot all your I's, you cross all your T's, come up with $200. And then you look at the stock price and it's $600 per share. What's your rational side say? Don't buy that stock, right? And then you hear this voice in the back of your head, they must know something that you don't, speaks in a monotone, don't ask me why. But when you heard that voice, magical things would start to happen to your valuation. You would revisit your growth rates and nudge them a little higher. You will revisit your margins. Let me make that number a little higher. Revisit the discount rate. Let me make it lower. The 200 will become 250, will become 300, will become 350. Don't fight it. There's a lemming inside each and every one of you dying to get out. Let it out. In fact, you can divide the whole world of investors into three groups of lemmings. The first group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors, but it's pretty much the same thing, right? What do they do? They look for momentum. You're buying, I'm buying. You're selling, I'm selling. Why are you buying? I don't care. Proud lemmings. The second group I call yogi bear lemmings. No, are there any of you read the Yogi Bear comics, but he was smarter than the average bear. Yogi Bear lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. You know what they want to do? They want to run to the very edge of the cliff and the last moment we are away. Great if you can pull it off, right? You get all the upside of momentum and none of the downside. Admit it, you're tempted. The problem with the Yogi Bear lemming is they don't know where the cliff is coming. If you ask me to describe myself, I'm not a proud lemming. I can't pull off just going with the flow because everybody else is flowing. I am not smarter than the average lemming. I have no idea where the cliff is. See that lemming in towards the back there? If you ask me to describe myself, that's the best I can aspire to be a lemming with a life vest. That's what valuation gives me. It gives me a life vest, something else to hold on to when everybody else changes their mind. If I bought GameStop for, 300, GameStop for 300 and the only rationale I have is there's somebody else out there who paid me 400, I might make money, but what could change if everybody changes their minds? I'm left with nothing. There is nothing behind my investments. That's all valuation does. It doesn't make you a rational person. It gives you something else to hold on to. So let's lay note, lay bare some misconceptions about valuation that are widely held, but still drive what we think about valuation. Here's the first one. Evaluation is an objective search for the truth, that you're some kind of scientist trying to put a number on a company. Dispense with that delusion. 
there are no unbiased valuations. Every valuation is biased. And the sooner we're honest about that bias, the better our valuations will get. So where does the bias come from? Everything you know about the company, every encounter you've had with the company. I'll give you a personal example. I have valued Microsoft every year since 1986. That's the year of their IPO. Between 1986 and 2014, every single time I valued Microsoft, I, I found it to be overvalued. You named the price was overvalued that price, $2, $3, seven. Strange, right? One of the great success stories of US equity markets of the 20th century, I wouldn't have bought it one step of the way. Now I could give you access to every single valuation I've done of Microsoft from 1986 to 2014. You could dig through the valuations looking for why I found it to be overvalued. But you'd be looking in the wrong place. It's a pity we're not at Stern because all you needed to do is come up to my office on the ninth floor. And here's what you'd have seen. You walk into the room, you'd have been surrounded by apples. Apple iPads, Apple. I'm an Apple user. I've been an Apple user since 1981. To me, Microsoft has always been the Darth Vader of technology. For those of you who are Star Wars fans, I'm not talking Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader. I'm talking Darth, Darth Vader. I had a lot of bad thoughts about Bill Gates. And every time I sat down to value Microsoft, they'd come bubbling up to the surface. You know what I learned from that? I'm far too biased to value Microsoft. You know who else I'm far too biased to value, right? I've given away the, the, the story. Who else am I far too biased to value? Twitter. Apple. If I hate Microsoft too much, and I love them, it's Apple. Of course, Twitter I hate too, but that's for a different reason. But I've actually valued Apple every year for the last 11 years on my blog. And I, if you get a chance, go back and visit my very first valuation of Apple on my blog. I spent half my post asking people not to trust me. I said, look, I love the company too much. So keep that in mind. I've, I just, I, my priors are too strong. You think what changed in 2014 with Microsoft? Here's what changed. I felt sorry for the company. Because if you remember 2014, Apple was ascendant, Microsoft was this old, boring company, that new CEO, everybody was beating up on Microsoft. I finally felt sorry enough for the company I was able to value it. I actually bought Microsoft in 2014 after that valuation. But my point is, when you pick a company, here's what I'd like you to do. And I'd like you to pick a company soon to value because you can change your mind. I'd like you to write down what you think about the company right now. See, you know what I mean by it? No, so do any of you have a company in mind already that you, that you would like to value? Bajal, do you have a company in mind you want to value? Now, I want, I want somebody who actually has a strong idea. Daniel, you have a company in mind? Um, yeah, McDonald's. What's McDonald's. And why do you pick McDonald's? Uh, I think they're like the landscape of fast food is changing really quickly. And McDonald's. Badly, badly or well for McDonald's? Uh, badly for McDonald's, but I, okay. I think they've always somehow innovated to keep up with the way it's changing. Okay. I'm curious to see uh, how that shapes up. Okay. So already Daniel's giving some priors, right? He says, look, the landscape is changing, but I like the company. Is that going to affect his valuation? Absolutely. That's called a prior. In statistics, there's a branch of statistics called Bayesian statistics, where you state your priors before you show me your analysis. What I'd like you to do right now, uh, before you do any number crunching on your company, is take a company that you're picking and tell me why you picked it and what you think you're going to find in this valuation. I know it's kind of backwards. You're saying, I haven't done the numbers. Tell me what your priors are and what do you think the end game is going to look like? Do you think you're going to find your company to be undervalued, overvalued? Because at the end of the 15th week, I'm going to ask you to pull up your actual results and we'll do a correlation of what you thought you would find and what you actually found. Let's see what it looks like.
So I'm going to stop there because uh, you know it's uh, we're running out of time, but I will see you on Wednesday and expect an email after this class kind of pulling together all the different things we talked about. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Professor, quick question before we go. Um, yep. I picked up a copy of your second edition investment valuation. I assume that's not a problem. No, because as I said, you don't even need a book. So if you have yeah. a you know, second edition is better than no book at all. So that'll be fine. Gotcha. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good day. Bye.